Okay, Rotarians, that's the last time you'll be hearing that marimba music from uh, Oaxaca, from Chiapas. And uh, I invite you to go to um, YouTube if you want to learn more about it. Uh, just hit the, the marimba name on it and up will come all the Evan. that I've gotten. Honey, okay. I can't hear anything. Can you help me? I stop the video. Yep. Oh. Can you... Uh, Please mute your, can you mute your uh, phone, your microphone, please? All right, here we go. Welcome, um, Romina, Dr. Romina Tomaneng. She joined our club in 2020, just before COVID. The first generation immigrant from the Philippines and a community college transfer student, very familiar with the Valley, served as Associate Vice President of Instruction at De Anza for six years, then was president of Berkeley City College and is now President of San Jose City College at, at the um, Evergreen Community College District. So, happy birthday, Ramona uh, Rowena Tomaneng. Next, uh, our inspirational thought for the day is brought to us by Pat Tejans. She was born and raised in San Jose. She went to Leland High School, went to the University of Washington, been away for 20 years, lived in China seven years, speaks Mandarin. Her wife is Chinese, and they now live in San Jose. Her sponsor is James. Williams and Susan Albury. Pat, you ready to go? I sure am. Thank you, President Fernando. Hit it. Yeah, I should start my timer here. Okay. How are you? Good, good, good. Go ahead. So I'm actually asking everyone. I know you can't answer. It's sort of a rhetorical <laughs> question, but but how are you? Great. Doing great. Me, how? This question has taken on. Uh, well, thank you. And you? <laughs> I am. Um, I am doing well. Thank you. I have a lot to be grateful for. And uh, you know, this question has taken on new meaning, hasn't it? When people ask this, and I, I find that to be true. And when I was asked to do this inspirational opening here for Rotary, um, boy, it felt like it was a different world even just a month or so ago. And uh, as my date got closer and closer, I kept sort of changing and shifting, uh, you know, what I would say. And, uh, and then Justice Gin Ginsburg passed away. And, uh, and that had a big impact on me. Um, just really quick, I want to say that President Karen um, was amazing in inspiring me to join and my sponsor, uh, James Williams, and co-sponsor, uh, Susan Ellenberg, and, uh, and a mentor, um, Ed Karina. So, Boy, I have a lot of support, and I hope that all of you have support, too. You know, I read a blog recently by my, uh, my friend, my co-sponsor, Susan Ellenberg, and I, I got her permission to share parts of it. I hope that I do it justice because she was able to speak to something that I couldn't find the words for. And the, I'll, I'll leave the link for it in the, uh, in the chat here. And the title of her article is Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg Died and I broke. So that might not sound very inspirational, but bear with me here. Uh, it starts off by saying 2020 has been rough. And um, I'll just read an excerpt here from Susan Ellenberg. I broke because I felt like she was the last thread holding our country to some kind of ethical standard. And she goes on to say a lot of uh, beautiful words, but I just realized that maybe my time is running out. There's beautiful quotes by Ruth um, Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ginsburg. One of them is real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. And I'd like to read a very quick poem by uh, Rosemary Watola Traumer from the PBS NewsHour article. After RBG's death, this po poet urges us to follow in her steps. And the poem is called In the Steps of RBG by Rosemary Watolo Traumer. So let me take one step right now, one step toward respect, and give me strength to take another toward clarity. And though my feet might feel like stones, let me take another step toward justice and another toward equity and another toward truth. And though my legs may feel laden and slow, though someone else may step on my toes, may I inch toward forgiveness. May every step be toward a bridge, 
enough divisiveness. And as I go, may I find joy in the stepping, grace in the edging toward great change. But if there's little joy, let me step away, then take another step and another and another. You know, a lot of people have been talking about carrying the torch of what uh, Justice Ginsburg left behind. And I'd like to close with- Beth, we're, we're, we're going beyond time here. Can, can we just say thank you for, for the sure. reading? I just, sure, I just want to say that um, you may be written, written and bound up in the book of life and may we all see a new year of less brokenness, renewed energy and more justice and good health. That's the words of Susan Ellenberg. So I wish that for all of you. It's so nice to be connected and thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Pat. Uh, now, Todd Langton is with New York Life Insurance. Is a new is a return here from St. George, Utah. Todd, are you ready? Yes, yes. Thank you again, Todd Langton, and uh, financial advisor with New York Life Night Life Securities. I was referred, uh, sponsored, and mentored by the legendary one and only Mauricio Cardova, who's become a good friend of mine, and I really appreciate him. Excuse the sunspots. I forgot to wear my sunscreen at the uh, barbecue a couple of weeks ago, the Rotary Barbecue. And by the way, I loved every minute of that. I'm a single guy, married once, divorced a, a while back. I grew up mostly in the Midwest and Mountain West and Minnesota, uh, Kansas, Montana, Wisconsin, and uh, graduated from the University of Utah in political science. And I am a, uh, I'm definitely a, a political junkie. I enjoyed the circus last night in a few ways and not in other ways. Uh, I grew up in a large Mormon family and uh, served a mission to New Zealand when I was 23 through 25, a couple of best years of my life, loved it. I graduated from the, U I mentioned that, University of Utah Political Science. Moved to California in 1998 uh, to Santa Rosa then down to San Jose in 2009. I've got a couple of passions of mine that are really my two favorite hobbies and also my two favorite passions. I serve on the board of uh, World Access Project. We collect used wheelchairs, walkers, canes, and crutches, and we ship them down to Mexico for the underprivileged uh, people and with disabilities down in Mexico. We also raise money for them. They're very tied to the Rotary, the other board of directors are, and uh, I'm very, um, very passionate about that. Very passionate also about the homeless problem we have here in San Jose, a group of us go out uh, weekly and, and serve the homeless. We're looking to not only serve them food and, and give them clothing like we've been doing the last several years, but also find a way to be more of a matchmaker and match them with all the services that are available out there from the nonprofits and the, and the government agencies. Well, Todd, we're so running some time yeah. here. We, we wanted to learn a little bit about you, and I think you've told us a little bit, and we look forward to meeting you in person. But thank Great. you. How much for joining us. Gay Crawford, you've got the, the mic now for the fine opportunities. Gay Crawford. Well, let's see what happened to our gay. I knew gay. I'm so sorry. Hey, oh, picture true. me running around uh, the Summit Center, and uh, we have some bells to ring for some very fine announcements. And Brian Adams is our first, so Brian, take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. In these uh, troubling times, it's always great to turn to the youth uh, for some inspiration and hope. And we, our family, welcomed the latest edition, uh, Ella Josephine Adams uh, was born September 5th of this year to our youngest son, Jeffrey, and his wife, Monique. And uh, so welcome to the world, Ella. And uh, you see her there. And then uh, in October, October 20th, it'll be the second birthday of our grandson, Lincoln, who is the uh, son of uh, fellow Rotarian Nicholas Adams and his wife, Shannon. And... Uh, you can see what joy they bring to us. So I would like to ring the bell. I was thinking two times because of two grandchildren, but let's, uh, let's ring it three times. One for Ella starting her first year and two rings for Lincoln celebrating his second year of life. Thank you. Oh, Brian, thank you. 
That is terrific. And, and Howard Loomis, I understand you have something to celebrate as well. Absolutely. Uh, Tessa Lewis Work was born September 3rd this year and arrived at 8 pounds, 15 ounces. Brothers Craig, five and a half, and Philip, three, shown here. And cousin Wesley, age four, welcome Tessa, uh, who is Karen and my uh, fourth grandchild. So in celebration of our fourth, uh, please ring the bell four times. Wow. <laughs> Keep ringing, Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> Very tinny sound. Sorry, Howard. Next. Sounds like a bicycle bell. And our final ring is from John Ball, who has lots to celebrate. John Ball. I do. Thank you. So I want to ring the bell a total of five times, three times, uh, one each for what I feel like I've given birth to three babies myself. And those are the three finalists for the Urban Confluence Silicon Valley competition, which were unveiled to the public on September 18th. So three times for each of those finalists. Uh, and uh, once for, ring it once for Paul Cobb and the Open Post newspapers and the founder, Tom Berkeley, who I had the pleasure to meet back in the day. And then lastly, I want to ring it one more time for my wife, Paula, who just finished 160 thank you notes to the people that were uh, gracious enough to donate to our fundraiser on September 18th. So, uh, Thank you very much for indulging me with five rings. You bet. Thank you very much, John Ball. And thank you. congratulations for the urban confluence that you put together. And now we've got uh, Dr. Karen Philbrick, the Executive Director of Mineta Institute and Vice Chair of the Membership Committee. And she will do some introductions. Go ahead, uh, Doctor. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians and friends. What a pleasure it is to serve as the Vice Chair of your Membership Committee. As we all know, Rotary develops character, brings out the best of human spirit. It teaches us ethics, humanity, cultural awareness, and sensitivity. But membership growth is the engine that drives our club, and recruitment and retention is of critical importance. To that end, today we will learn successful strategies for recruitment from two of our club superstars, including Rod Deridon Sr., who joined our club in 1971, and over the course of his almost 50-year tenure, he has recruited over 150 new Rotarians, many of whom are still active in our club today, and that is tremendous. Then we will have the pleasure of hearing from Nuria Fernandez, General Manager of CEO of Valley Transportation Authority, a trailblazing leader and terrific member, mentor, and a member of our club since 2015. So without further ado, Rod and Nuria, please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Philbrick. And uh, I'll go quickly, because I have the sense that Fernando's behind in time a little bit. Actually, we're right on time. We're one minute ahead of schedule. Well, that'll work for me. I can use it. <laughs> you got a total of 10 minutes between you and uh, Nuria. Thank you, boss. All right, hit it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're charging. Uh, our, our responsibility today is to help you with the recruitment and retention process. And then uh, Larry Stone and Suzanne St. John Crane will talk to you about uh, activation and retention in January. So uh, uh, Larry and Suzanne are superstars uh, in the membership area also. So... <clears throat> Let me begin by noting that the best, the best possible Rotarian is your best friend who isn't a Rotarian yet. That's a kind of a, an old saw that we have used in Rotary for many years, but it's, it's the truth. So look around you and think of your best friends who aren't Rotarians yet. Remember also that uh, we need to become more diverse. Rotary needs to represent the valley, the area that we represent. And uh, we had become... Uh, kind of gray and male and white uh, in a majority back about 20 years ago and still are too. Uh, and uh, Fernando's uh, 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 objective uh, during his year is to change that. So we've done a needs assessment and found that we're, we're lacking in, uh, in some of the areas. 
Remember that in the population now, according to the census updated, uh, you know, the white population is only 35%, Asians 32%, Latinx is 27%, African American is 2%, and others are 4%. Uh, so uh, so uh, our, our club is a long ways from representing those kinds of proportions. So we need, we have a job to do. Uh, when you're recruiting, uh, the best thing to do Remember that Rotarians are leaders, so you'll be asked for your advice frequently on, uh, on leadership opportunities for young people. When, when that happens, uh, judge whether that young person is the kind of a person you'd like to have in Rotary, and if so, invite them to attend a meeting. Uh, let them know that uh, our lunch meetings are attended often by the mayor, council members, the county executive, DA, assessor, assessor frequently, uh, uh, judges, uh, VTA, water district, and, and uh, VTA GM, and we're really uh, lucky to have uh, Nuria with us today, commercial and nonprofit uh, leaders and so on. And it's an opportunity for these young leaders coming up to join into Rotary and to, uh, uh, to meet those uh, that, that new cadre of outstanding uh, community leaders in a social setting. And then if, if someone shows interest, uh, send them a membership application, invite them to lunch to, with you. Zoom now, but later it, in person. Remember the club pays for the lunch and, uh, and invite them uh, with an email and also send them a fillable membership application along with the email, just in case they're interested. And, and ask, in case you're interested. And uh, remember that the fee is, is, is high now, but you can Control that a little bit in the future. I don't go into the fee a whole lot unless they ask about it. Uh, um, remind them they don't have to attend every meeting. Uh, remember, have great speakers. We have great camaraderie. And it's an opportunity for you to create a wonderful new friends. And then, uh, and then uh, frequently, they'll send back that application or they'll call you and talk to you about the application. And you can encourage them then to fill it out and send it back with the middle of the second page uh, sign. Make sure they've read the <coughs> cover material, though, that helps them understand Rotary. Now, that, uh, that gives you an idea how to get through the ask and the application process. Let me uh, introduce Nuria Fernandez now. Uh, or is, is Karen going to introduce Nuria? I don't think I need introduction. <laughs> well, well, really just in the interest of time. <laughs> let me, let me uh, just a word. Nuria Fernandez is an absolute international transportation superstar. She, I have absolute confidence that if uh, uh, the presidency had turned out differently in 2018, Nuria would have been our Secretary of Transportation. This year, she's the president of the American Public Transit Association in Washington, D.C., one of many national responsibilities she's carried. And she's our own very own DTA. General Manager and CEO. Thank you, Rod. You're my number one fan. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And uh, I, I'll be quick because I recognize that um, in that introduction, we ate up a little bit of time, but I'm delighted to be here and I'm so excited that we're taking this initiative to the next step. You know, we are growing diversity membership uh, really brings a lot of different perspectives and ideas. And just looking at this um, tile today, and it's just beautiful to see all of the members that are, have joined today's meeting. So as we're thinking about, uh, Rod went through all of the steps in identifying and then getting people on board, but I wanted to look at this from a different angle, and that is uh, reaching out to members of the community, uh, of the very diverse community that we have, and those who were in leadership roles, and finding out what they knew about us. So how best to test the all are welcome by reaching out to some of these individuals and asking a few questions. So I contacted leaders in the Vietnamese American, African American, and India, Indian diaspora, as well as the Latinx communities, I asked three questions. One, are you familiar with Rotary Club of San Jose? Two, have you ever been invited to join our Rotary Club? And if not, would you consider becoming a member? Then three, I said, share the names of individuals in leadership positions at community organizations or companies that target ethnic groups in your area so that we can do some outreach. So the quick answers, um, 
yes, they were all familiar with the Rotary Club of San Jose, which is a positive. It was good. Uh, they have attended a business meeting, I don't know, barbecue, mostly barbecue as guests. Uh, but no, they have not been asked to join. So I think that there's an opportunity there that we need to uh, take a closer look at and come up with a strategy of when we invite guests is to follow through. But the responsibility is not just of the person who invites the guests. It's also of those who know when we introduce our guests and everyone claps and you're like, oh, I know that person, is to also step in and say, you know what, uh, let's partner up and ask this individual if they want to join and then you can sponsor and I'll be a co-sponsor. And uh, if they, when only one said, uh, not sure, if I want to join, it seems like Rotary has a lot of resources. You've had a lot of people. It's well endowed, and I'm working with different organizations in my community that are smaller and really need help and are, are targeting some very specific needs of the community. So I said, you know what? There's room for all. But those that are interested were uh, very complimentary of what they saw when they came, and they even but they commented that there was a lack of diversity at the events, and it was just very noticeable uh, that adding more seats to the table will in fact be a very positive outcome, and uh, also that many of the organizations and business and even the government sector that is represented in our Rotary Club employs minorities in leadership ranks, so that is a very easy pool to tap into. So in conclusion. Diversifying our Rotary Club of San Jose is everyone's responsibility. Uh, there isn't a lack of leaders from diversity groups in our community, and we should need to put the action behind the all are welcome sign. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, both uh, to you and to Rod. I think the most important um, part that I picked up from everything that's been said, which is all important, was asking or suggesting you become a co-sponsor with somebody who may know a guest that was brought to Rotary. Because as a team, as a co-sponsoring team, I think it increases the likelihood that you will receive a positive response. And I have to say that uh, that has been very successfully used as an approach in other clubs that have noticed an increase in acceptance for membership. We're not lowering any standards. All we're doing is extending our efforts to those areas that we may not have thought of in the past, not just our friends, which are certainly a key here, but as Miriam pointed out, looking toward uh, these other ethnicities that we know of. There's over 70 different languages that are spoken at v uh, VMC. They have interpreters for that many people. That gives you an idea how diverse our valley is. And so we need to do what we can to reach out and uh, achieve that particular goal. So I want to thank both you uh, and uh, Rod for your very considered comments. And I hope our members understand that it's everyone's responsibility, not the membership committee. They're the ones that are responsible for vetting the people that you bring to us. But it's up to every member of our Rotary Committee, I mean Rotary Club, to uh, do that, to keep an eye out, to be on the lookout for potential leaders that we encounter and think about doing what Nuria and Rod have suggested. Uh, it's not a lot of rocket science involved here, but it does require some effort. Sometimes for some of you, it may be a little bit uncomfortable, but I want to encourage you to do that. Thank you. Now I'd like to give uh, uh, some other notices. Uh, our Thanksgiving program, a la Bob Key, may you rest in peace, for November 18th requires 10 to 12 people to give a brief one to two minute talk about why or what they are grateful for this year. That always in the past has been one of the most interesting and enlightening uh, moments in our Rotary Club year. As Bob required, all scripts, and they have to be scripted so you know how to measure your time, must be submitted to Lenore Keeve or Gay Crawford, whom you met already, in advance to make sure your comments are within the time limits. This is your chance to let us know more about you, and it's really a wonderful opportunity for the club to get to know us individually a lot better. Also, um, thanks to our meeting summaries committee writers. They're doing such a, an excellent job that I hope that you take advantage of that service and read up 
on their summaries because sometimes you may have missed something important or we may have said something that triggers a thought in your mind that will uh, move you to action. Uh, also, you know, the Rotary International Conference is coming up uh, next June, but the opportunity to take advantage of discounted hotel rooms ends on October 15th. So if you are planning to do that, now's the time to jump on it. Okay, next we've got Dr. Arthur L. Jew, CEO of Live Freely and member of our program committee, who did so well last week introducing Kerry Keesum that he'll introduce our program speaker for today. Arthur, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yep, you got it. Great. Thank you, President Fernando. Um, I'm pleased today to introduce Paul Cobb, journalist, activist, humanitarian, and owner of eight Bay Area newspapers. Paul grew up in West Oakland, graduated from Pacific Union College, and attended Howard University. He also holds an honorary doctorate from Holy Names University. He spent considerable time in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, where as a reporter at the Oakland Post, he marched in 1965 for voting rights from Selma to Montgomery with Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and John Lewis. He's been a radio commentator and lectured on black history to the founders of the Black Panthers, among other groups. Paul directed Occur, a social activist government monitoring watchdog organization that fought for jobs and state highway projects. He actually went to jail protesting the non-hiring of blacks. He also went to jail demanding the Oakland Public Schools hire a black superintendent, which eventually they did, Marcus Foster, who some of you may remember was assassinated for trying to keep drugs out of school campuses. Under Paul's leadership, Oakland established its first recycling center and planted 1,400 trees and community gardens at school sites. Paul was awarded the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Fellowship for his efforts in community development, organized West Oakland Health Center, and worked on the presidential can candidate George McGovern as a speechwriter and as a national vote director for African Americans from his office in Watergate Tower. He was a national field director for the Southern Election Fund, which helped elect hundreds of blacks into public office uh, from many states. As a coordinator of the Southern Regional Council, he worked closely with the Emergency Land Fund, Federation of Southern Cooperatives, Voter Education Project, and faith-based communities, uh, one of which, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, helped facilitate Paul's talk here today. So we welcome uh, church communication representatives as our guests this afternoon. Paul's been very active in CERT, uh, helping to rebuild Oakland after the Loma Prieta earthquake and led efforts to reroute Highway 880, which helped stimulate transport across the port of Oakland and spurred Emeryville business and shopping center developments. Thank you, Dr. Jude. You want to now give the floor to uh, Paul, please. Yes, happy to do so. We welcome now Paul Cobb. Okay, I want to thank the gentleman for the introduction. He was doing so well, he could probably finish giving my remarks. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. I would like to invite uh, Fernando to alert me at the 10 minute mark because I fear the wrath of his timekeeping. I want to stay within the limits that have been prescribed by Arthur Jew's instructions. Is that okay? That's fine. Give me, give me a signal. I want to say good afternoon to you, the members of the San Jose Rotary. I was inspired by the inspirational words uh, earlier. Um, as I, as he said, my name is Paul Cobb and my wife's name is Gay Claire Cobb. And we are the principal co-owners of the 57-year-old Post News Group and El Mundo Newspapers. We have been the owners since 2004. The, our newspaper is a Black-owned, freely distributed weekly that is audited and has a verified audited status for the last 14 years. We now have eight mastheads that circulate from Oakland, San Francisco, Marin County, Alameda County, to Vallejo and Stockton, uh, as well as in English and uh, Spanish, our Spanish language newspaper, El Mundo. I'm deeply honored and grateful for this opportunity to talk with you today about the role of the black press and why it matters. Before I begin my brief remarks, I would like to thank Dr. Arthur Jew for inviting me. I met him and NAACP's Reverend Jethro Moore at a faith-based open house gathering at Temple Hill in Oakland, uh, sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. 
And we discussed then at that meeting the possibilities of media collaboration for the San Jose, Santa Clara, Silicon Valley area. And since that initial meeting several months ago, I have zoomed in on conference calls with the founders of the San Jose Spotlight, uh, spe specifically with the um, careful guidance of the calendar, the NAACP and other community-based leaders, whereupon they extended a welcome to, an, uh, to us and an invitation for us to bring the Post News Group and El Mundo to your community. And I'd like to report to you that we are in the finalizing, we're in the stages of finalizing a partnership with San Jose Spotlight and the city, which is the city's independent nonprofit news organization. We hope to expand our coverage and reach the South Bay's black community in a new way of trying to meet the needs of diversity. These organizations agree with us that the black press still matters as it has historically uh, since the founding of the first black newspaper in America in 1827, Freedom's Journal. From 1830 to the Civil War, there were 30 black newspapers. The black press mattered by encouraging the anti-slavery abolitionists prior to the Civil War, during the Civil War, by encouraging Blacks to follow in the tradition of Crispus Attucks, who was the first person to die in the Revolutionary War by joining his effort by becoming soldiers in the Union Army against the Southern Confederacy. And, and from 1876 to 1918, the Black press chronicled the killings and lynchings of more than 3,000 Black men by white mobs, while the news, this news was ignored by the majority white presses throughout the country. After World War II, there were as many as 500 Black newspapers that helped to surge service the burgeoning population of Blacks who had moved from the South and had migrated to the North and to Western regions. The Black press mattered as a vital source of information on how to survive and navigate through the difficult times of racial discrimination and neglect. And now today, there are more than 200 Black newspapers still publishing throughout the country, continuing the advocacy needs and messages around police, community relations, quality education, census participation, voter registration, and high achievements and advances of individuals and groups. The black press has always mattered when it came to awakening blacks and whites to the need for equal opportunities for blacks around jobs, housing, bank financing, for loans to help start and maintain businesses. The Black press, along with the NAACP and Black churches, have been and still do put pressure on this country's Fortune 500 companies to advertise and do business with Black media for our fair share, especially since our spending power now is greater than $1 trillion annually. Black, black lives mattered and Black lives spending matters as well. The black spending matters as well. The black press mattered by encouraging the anti-slavery abolitionists prior to the Civil War, during the Civil War, by encouraging blacks to follow in that tradition. The fight for equity and fairness has been a continuing struggle since the United States Congress formed uh, the Freedmen's Bank in 11 southern states because white banks would not accept deposits from blacks. White banks would not accept black money. The black press mattered as it told that story of how blacks through the Freedmen's Bank opened up more than 400,000 bank deposit accounts that required so much historical information to open the account that it became the first actual recorded census of black people and their families. Since the, the official U.S. census did not start listing Blacks until 1870. And the Black press mattered when they spoke out against Congress's 
bank which had amassed more than $57 million of black deposits from former slaves that ultimately, ultimately saw their money being loaned and accessed by white individuals and corporation borrowers. And that included such companies as railroad and insurance companies. And some of these companies are still in existence today, even though they never paid back those loans. When Congress did not enforce the debt collection, they immediately encouraged Frederick Douglass, who was the Oprah Winfrey of the day in terms of personal wealth, to invest a major portion of his wealth to try to salvage the Freedmen's Bank Institution. But it closed. We lost your audio, Dr. Hall. We lost your audio there, Paul. Unmute yourself. You muted yourself by accident. Okay, am I back on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, where did I lose it? Where did you hear last? Uh, I heard last that the banks were not accepting deposits from blacks. <laughs> what a time yeah. to lose it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad it's back on because I hope to accept the deposits. Some of these companies are still in existence today. Frederick Douglass ultimately bailed it out or tried to bail it out, but he was left holding the bag. The black press told those stories to no avail. And even today in this Did you do it again, Paul? Now he's frozen. Oh dear. Paul, can you hear us? Not sure what happened here. Did He's you lose it now. Can you hear me? Now yes, you can now. Uh, yeah, oh. I can hear you. Yeah. You were frozen okay. there for a sec. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. We have been we have been publishing a series of articles recently about the roles of blacks in the early formation, something you probably did not know, of Silicon Valley companies. Um, two year, <clears throat> uh, uh, Silicon Valley companies. The, uh, uh, Adrian White, um, the daughter of Albert White, wrote a book called Internet Technology and uh, the Race for the Net when African-Americans control the internet and what happens now. Internet technology, which is changes the Not sure what's going on with your program. It freezes up. Probably the internet connection. Yep. It's an internet connection, yeah. Most likely. Oh, Paul, I'm, I'm going to stop the video. My wife says if I take the video off, the, the sound is strong. Is that okay? Can you hear me? I'm going to close. I'm, I'm winding down. Uh, <laughs> in an era where the lives, contributions, and achievements by African Americans are becoming more recognized and appreciated, we now can be aware that this revolutionary internet technology was first launched by the African American community in 1993. It was an African-American owned company that was selected by the United States federal government in 92 to open the door to the internet worldwide. The name of the company was Network Solutions. Yes, it's the same company that exists today, was founded by a diverse group of individuals in 1979. Albert White, uh, vice president for that company, was instrumental and many of the tech Fortune 500 companies that existed between 93 and 95 received their internet addresses from the African American company. Amazon was one of the uh, one was one of these uh, African Amer was one of these uh, companies that received their license from the uh, uh, from this company, providing the email addresses we now today are en enabling them to build a mega enterprise and enormous, enormous wealth for Jeff Bezos. Uh, most experts believe internet, 
a technology with artificial intelligence and, and the internet of things will expand its economic value to $25 trillion in less than five years. Um, these are the types of stories we have been publishing in a series that have been circulated nationwide, and we look forward to doing the same thing with stories and their tributaries um, in the Silicon Valley area. We hope we can uh, find ways to work together. Um, um, and because this community sits astride the world's uh, communication hubs and innovations, we feel we together can promote the positive achievements such as was recently enacted by the Santa Clara Board of Supervisors when um, Costello, at the urging of um, Reverend Jethro Moore of the NAACP, uh, making uh, enacted legislation to make your community uh, the nation's first to declare Juneteenth an official holiday. Those kind of pioneering moves and others can be promulgated throughout the Bay Area and the country. We look forward to partnering and working with the NAACP, Spotlight, San Jose State School of Journalism, the Rotary, and any other group or individuals that want to see positive coverages of the voices and needs of Black community. By working together, I hope we can make a change. And by working together, I hope we can ho help to better things because working together works. Thank you. I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, we really appreciate being here. We have a number of questions that have come in. Uh, the first one is from David Ginsburg, who asks, um, who does Mr. Cobb feel is doing the same type of quality journalism in the Latino, Chinese, or Vietnamese communities? Uh, <laughs> we are, and uh, I think that there are several groups uh, that are doing it in Southern California. Um, I know that uh, uh, Sandy Close, who has the uh, Bay Area New Media Group that provides information to Asian publications, uh, is doing a wonderful job. I worked with her when I wrote for her paper in 1966 called The Flatlands. Uh, she's still happily working in journalism. Um, I, 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 there are three, about 300 Latino ex newspapers throughout the country, and there are 200 black newspapers. I don't know how many Asian newspapers, but we do collaborate with the local reporters for Sing Tao Daily and uh, other Asian publications. And uh, in fact, we have a reporter now in Taiwan who is a former Oakland police officer who happens to be black, who uh, speaks Mandarin fluently and teaches Mandarin uh, uh, here. In fact, he published uh, some special articles and editions in Chinese, in Mandarin here in Oakland as a move to try to build bridges. So I'm not totally familiar with the Asian press community to uh, give you specific names at this time. Thank you, Paul. Uh, the next question is, what is being reported about violence before, during, and after BLM marches? Are there follow-up stories? Oh, yeah. We're doing a lot of follow-up stories, and we're doing inside stories about how uh, a lot of the BLM marches are being uh, opportunistically hacked by uh, interlopers uh, who are considered semi-terrorists or right-wing gun toters who are, uh, seek to intimidate and to besmirch the images of the demands for peace. 95% of the marchers who participate in BLM marches are doing it peacefully. I personally, as a observer in one march that was in Oakland, observed this uh, white gentleman who was walking along and he was giving bricks to young blacks and telling them to throw it and break windows and go steal tennis shoes, et cetera. So they are being, because of their open-ended, non-security prone approach to marching with the emphasis on peacefulness 
rather than self-policing, they have, uh, they have unwittingly uh, become actor, victims of uh, uh, what I consider uh, violent prone hackers who, have, who start the process by encouraging young uh, uh, angry students who are angry about whatever issue to break a window, to steal something, and that starts the quote, the negative ball rolling, which invites the police in, they crack down and then there's an overreaction. So uh, that the white press and the black press needs to jointly do a, an in-depth investigative reporting on that because it unfairly taints the role of police as well as the community. And one thing that came out in this kind of reporting, and we wrote the story, and that was in um, Minneapolis, the first window broken and the first fire started was by an off-duty white policeman who wanted to quote, uh, and then bl block the thrust of the civil rights movement. Thank you, Paul. Um, this question comes from Suzanne St. John Crane. We are all from in whom? Uh, Suzanne. Um, okay. We are all in an extraordinary time in this country when it comes to the ripping off of the Band-Aid to again expose pervasive racism in the U.S. How does this movement compare with other civil rights movement that you've seen and been a part yes. of? Yes. I, I didn't get that last part. There was so how does how does this compared with other civil rights movement that you've seen and been a part of? Well, it's very simple: cell phones and the internet. <laughs> That's how it differs. I mean, uh, in 1965, when I marched with Dr. King and John Lewis, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, all we had was Wallensack tape recorders and uh, maybe the, uh, uh, those uh, micro camera You're fading out a little bit, I think, Paul. Paul, you still there? I think you might might have been frozen again. He can just call in on his cell phone too. Yeah. Uh, did we lose him? He dropped off. He's not here. I don't think. Okay, he may be dialing back in on his uh, cell phone. Yes, Paul's no longer in the room. Oh, what a shame. I mean, he's had, has a lot of information, a lot of experience, and we would be uh, uh, at a loss here if we don't get a chance to reconnect with him. See if we can uh, get him back on. I know... Uh... You know, our invitation doesn't give people the cell number to call in, just the Zoom, unfortunately. He's back. Ah, Paul, you back? I don't, I don't, I don't see, see him yet. Anyway, I'm back. But Oh, I think there you the are, Paul. The difference now is media and uh, exposure and instant communication and instant interactivity has changed everything. So the awareness levels have increased exponentially because everyone can be, everyone everywhere can be instantly aware of what is going on. And they can express themselves and react and uh, do whatever because uh, the technology has allowed mass mobile uh, communication participation. Thanks, Paul, appreciate it. Yes, it does, when it works, right? Uh, <laughs> we've got the next question from Brian Adams to everyone. Uh, what roles are black press leaders playing in battling uh, voter suppression this election year? 
Well, that's that, that's an issue uh, right up uh, my alley. I have uh, uh, been an advocate for awareness and activity all over the country. I, as a uh, the person who read the introduction in my bio at the beginning, uh, I have been in contact with, uh, I was with, in contact with John Lewis uh, three months prior to his death, and we were reminiscing on how we had together fought for battles and around voter registration, um, uh, as well as I uh, worked with Julian Bond and the Southern Elections Fund, where we elected Blacks throughout the South and women to become mayors and he ultimately became a congressperson. Voting is the most powerful tool. It is more important than, than guns or anything. It is the most powerful weapon and tool that black Americans and all of us have to make change, to make constructive, peaceful change that's lasting. I, I've been trying to talk to some of my friends who participate actively with BLM that they ought to uh, make voter registration, get out the vote activity and voter participation, the hallmark of the movement, because that's the way to continue to maintain the enormous support that they have enjoyed from the white community who have participated in these marches. Uh, uh, to, to keep it going. Voting is the key. And um, so I, I know I was the national director of minority voter participation for Senator McGovern when I had an office in the Watergate and uh, building. In fact, my office was right down the hall from the one that the burglars broke into. And I told a lot of the media people the reason why they didn't break into our office is because the FBI at that time had better information on black people than we did. So they didn't need to. <laughs> so, uh, um, but voting has always been at the crux of the, uh, the power struggle in this country to make changes. Thank you. Um, Judge Arthur Weisbrot has this question. Do you envision an era of important new civil rights legislation in the near future and if so, what new legislation do you think uh, might be realistic? Well, a restoration of voting rights bill that was uh, turned down by the Supreme Court. And that is the number one item is to restore uh, civil rights. Uh, I mean, the uh, civil rights bill as well as the voting rights bill. So to strengthen that and to strengthen the opportunities to get more blacks, to, to get uh, equitable participation in the cash flow characteristics of this country. Uh, blacks have been systematically denied access to capital, which is the basis of business formation, which is the engine that drives this economy. And I think that that's one of the good things that could come out of this. And I have faith that this new generation, especially those, a lot of the companies and individuals in your area that are pledging their volunteerism and some of their angel capital to help seed these kinds of activities. And I see that as a, an opportunity for, for growth and development for minorities as well as the, the country in general. Thank you, Paul. That ties into the next question. How important is financial education and investment opportunities to encourage wealth creation in black communities? <laughs> you, and you're stealing all of my remarks. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think it's critical and I think it's important. Um, as, as you could tell when I told the story of the Freedmen's Bank and thanks to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and their uh, extensive research in uh, family histories and genealogy, they were able to provide that data, which we are now utilizing to help uh, publish and promulgate the need and the awakening for Black financial inst institutions. I talked the other day with some rappers and entertainers in Atlanta, Georgia, who next week will be announcing the formation of a national blank back, I mean, black digital bank 
that will provide uh, uh, an opportunity for Blacks to do banking. They're going to come to the Bay Area for their first branch. So I see uh, financial literacy and education needs to be emphasized and um, supported, just like Chase Bank is doing with their youth enterprise thing. I wrote a proposal uh, and a letter to the Congressional Black Caucus to urge them to get digital tech companies to use their enormous uh, uh, wealth to help stimulate uh, not only Afro-tech ventures, but also uh, Afro-tech uh, economic literacy courses to teach Blacks how to go in business, how to understand investments and money. So this is a, these are the kinds of stories and opportunities that I think that we could do together, uh, together meaning through some of the partnerships of the groups that I mentioned earlier in my introduction, uh, that could become a model because of instant communication and Zoom-like education that the classroom of financial literacy can be simultaneously broadcast and uh, put forward because there are over 50,000 African-American houses of worship in the country that all have access to uh, monitors and some compu computer equipment that we could have a li financial literacy uh, classroom throughout America uh, after each church service and during after school time so that it could compete with the lure of the streets and gangs as uh, alternative uh, ways to distract our, our youth. Thank you. Uh, another question from Arthur Weisbrot. How can our Rotary Club most effectively reach out to African-American potential members? Um, by, first of all, accepting my membership and, uh, <laughs> and, and working with the NAACP and African-American groups in the, in the region that in Silicon Valley and uh, doing joint projects together. Be, because you have to understand that uh, no matter how small the, the minority population is there, because you sit astride the communication networks globally that that laboratory that uh, model of participation can become a part of a of laboratory that can instantly be uh, spread throughout the world and simultaneously be uh, mimicked and uh, collaborated with by communities all over the country the technology enables uh, a partnership with the NAACP for example through Spotlight and others and San Jose State Journalism Department and so forth to instantly make the entire minority community have access to uh, the content and the syllabuses that we developed in actual examples. Thanks. Um, this one is from Carl Salas and I think the gist of it is in the Selma March, it was 100% peaceful. And have you, do you have any thoughts or research on how we could duplicate that uh, peacefulness. Well, it, it wasn't a hundred percent peaceful. I, let me let me restate that. Uh, I uh, when we uh, at the end of the march after we completed uh, the march at Montgomery, we were walking back to the encampment, and Viola Liusa, white woman from Detroit, drove by to offer some of us a ride back to the camp. And sometimes your sixth sense kicks in. And here it was almost sundown. And I'm saying to myself, here am I, a white woman is driving a car. I'm going to be getting in the car. We're going to be going down a country road at night. I don't think so. So she, sure enough, an hour later, she was shot and killed. And... Uh, um, by some of the same kind of people that heckled us during the march. There wasn't um, the kind of um, interaction and violent encounters with police and others like you see today. It wasn't like that then, except for the day when we crossed the bridge and the state troopers 
met and beat John Lewis. That, um, that was uh, an encounter provoked by um, the, the police. So it wasn't totally uh, without bloodshed or without some form of violence, but it was not dominated by violent news coverage. Uh, thank you, thank you, Paul. I want to thank you for that. You've been uh, very patient. I don't know if you have time to talk to us after our meeting ends at 1.15. There were, I'm sure, other people that have questions for you, but it's really up to you uh, if you have any time after 1.15. Yes, thank okay. you for Me, the opportunity. I, thank you. I, I'll be speaking with you because I want to thank you <laughs> for this program. You've given us a lot to think about. And uh, listen, I'd be happy to co-sponsor you if you're willing to join us via Zoom. We'd, be, we'd love to have you. Um, and also, you should be pleased to know, instead of paying you cash, we're going to plant 46 shade trees. Not quite the 1,400 you planted, but we're going to plant. No, it, I want to correct that number. It was 14,000. All right. That's ah. another zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, ours is only 46, and we're paying uh, to have them planted in East San Jose to combat heat islands, climate change, and improve our neighborhoods. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up on this thing. Um, Right now, I just want to wrap it up here by telling the next week's speaker's father, Kevin O'Brien, uh, from Montreal, Quebec, uh, where he was born, former practicing attorney with a law degree from University of Florida. Last year, he was named the 29th president of the Santa Clara University, a Catholic wow. Jesuit uh, institution. He's the 29th president. He'll speak on Santa Clara University, our future vision. So I want to thank Brian, Howard, and John for their contribution to find opportunities. And now to paraphrase my favorite immigrant governor, hasta la vista, Rotarians, the Zoom meeting stands adjourned for now. And uh, those of you who want to stay on, uh, please do so. But for now, 1.15, we're done. Now Thank you, Paul. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Okay. You want to just continue down the list of questions for a bit? Sure, sure. Okay, so this one is from Steve Prouty. In your opinion, how well is the mainline press doing in fairly covering the BLM movement? Um, I think there's a lot of emphasis on the sensationalism of some of those who have inadvertently sloganized expressions like defund the police, uh, and they've taken it and run with it, and it has become a moniker and a describing, uh, and, and a descriptive term for the movement when that is not what a lot of the people who participated believe. But if a single person, though, grabs a, a microphone and speaks out, that well-placed comment can become the theme of that march or movement. And it then is instantly politicized because it's proliferated around the country. Great. Thank you. Is, uh, is there a website for your papers? Yes. www.postnewsgroup.com. All right, we'll try to type that in here. Um, where can we access, okay, uh, uh, publications and articles on Black Silicon Valley? Is that the same link? Where can you? Yeah, access recent publications and articles on Black Silicon Valley. I, uh, you can access that through our website, and I can do a special posting uh, to you to make sure that the series is... Uh, included we we did a series of four articles and uh, we're going to do more um uh on that subject but i can make sure that you get them thanks um the other arthur is actually another question that this arthur actually had uh and it is has the black press suffered in circulation and advertising because of the internet say that again i switched i switched uh what yeah. No problem. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you hear? Okay. 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 We're switching, switching uh, devices, which may okay. work better. So I'm signing out of this device, and Paul is on a new device. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay, now. Okay. You, you, my name comes up there now for a change. Yep. I, I see you there, Paul. Okay, so the question is, has the black press suffered in circulation and advertising because of the Internet? or even social media? Um, in circulation, 
uh, nationwide. Um, but uh, I think you're fading in and out, Paul. The Black Press has a paper of love, a commitment, as well as a business. Okay. We need we need um, uh, more advertising, and uh, we need to get um, support from. Um, I mean, that's there's an expression that we have that is not often made public that uh, we say amongst ourselves in the black community and amongst black leaders, and that is America will allow us to integrate almost everything except the money. And uh, uh, so uh, what we need is uh, partnerships that will allow us to crack open what I consider um, the uh, Rosetta Stone of sustainability and advertising. And that is the uh, companies that do the inserts into the Sunday papers. You know, when you open up your Sunday paper of the regular Metropolitan Daily, all of these uh, coupons and inserts fall out. Well, well, those are done by bundlers who uh, send them regularly. And, and newspapers can make enough money off of the inserts to sustain themselves. But we are locked out. Uh, because of discrimination and and uh, and and racism. Thanks, Paul. And tradition. Yeah, and, yep. and that applies to both Latino and Asian newspapers as well. And I think that's an opportunity to combine our strength. And uh, you know, I think that's something we can do. I have uh, written to uh, some employees of Facebook and. Uh, and spoken with uh, Google representatives and um, talking now with the Microsoft representatives about helping us launch uh, a website-based campaign to alert America as to how this wrong can be righted very easily. Thanks. Um, the uh, Arthur, the other Arthur has a, another question. It's a charge one. What was your personal reaction to last night's presidential debate? Um, <laughs> well, I, I want to join the Santa Clara Rotary, and I want I want to try to make as many friends as possible. Make uh, <laughs> that San Jose Rotary. I mean, this, yeah, the San Jose Rotary. What did I say? Santa Clara. I mean, Santa Clara. I, I apologize. I, I want to join the San Jose uh, Rotary, but I would like to say without alienating anybody. I, I'm I, Contrary to what some of the TV uh, pundits are saying, I think as a former speechwriter for presidential candidate and a participant at that level, I think Biden should continue. He should hope for a debate every night because, <laughs> and what he should do is cut his remarks in, in half and just continue to look at the camera with short, pithy statements about the, the, how we can all work together in unity phrases and let Trump self, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, not emulate, but what is it? Destruct. Let himself construct. And uh, I think that uh, that's what I would advise uh, Biden to do. He should Biden his time and let uh, Trump be Trump and he'll dump himself. And uh, I think that's what's going to happen. And I, I don't think he should try to do a tit for tat name calling or a street corner macho uh, style of one upsmanship back and forth. He should keep a very calm president and almost introduce every sentence an answer with when I'm president or as your president, I will do this to remind the audience that he's trying to be presidential and that he's not into uh, what do you call these wrestling matches, worldwide wrestling entertainment, mud, mud throwing uh, uh, approach to discussing issues and, and content. R reality TV. Yeah, reality. <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, this one is from uh, President Zazueta. Have you read the uh, Color of Law by Richard Rothstein, and if so, did that help you 
uh, in your current or historical understanding of uh, racist views? No, I haven't read it, but being a history major, I've read many books and uh, participated in many uh, efforts uh, nationally. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to do and not so much study, but to be an active, involved person in trying to solve problems. Well, thank you. I think we'll just let it open to open mic now. Anybody else have a question they want to interject? Yeah, yes, I, I think the speaker is wonderful. I, I wish him well with his crusades. Is he in the Rotary Club? Paul, I think you're looking for a sponsorship, right? Ron, I, I, I heard him say he wanted to uh, join the San Jose Rotary. That's I right. heard it too. I'll we're going to have, we're gonna have Rick, Rick Callender uh, will be your co-sponsor. And I know that Reverend Jethro Moore uh, is zoomed in today to hear uh, Paul speak. So uh, we're going to gang up on him. Should, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say one thing. I'd like to say one thing. You must read The Color of Law. It's an unbelievable book. In fact, everybody should, but certainly somebody that. in your position. Yeah, I second that, Larry. Make sure you have a good, strong stomach when you're reading it. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. And I uh, think that the uh, San Jose... Um, the San Jose Rotary Club should also read that book uh, by um, Al Albert called Race for the Net and uh, circulate it throughout uh, your connections in the area because that will open the eyes for a lot of people of how the role that Blacks played in uh, helping to start the uh, internet um, wave and boom throughout the country. It's called Race for the Net When African Americans Control the Internet. All right, good idea, good tip. Do we have any other uh, individuals out there, any members, any people that are listening that would like to ask uh, Paul Cobb a question, please uh, chime in. Okay, hearing none. I think that we can uh, wrap this up so that uh, our staff can go back to work. <laughs> Paul, you've been wonderful. We loved uh, hearing what you have to say. Sorry that you had these uh, various interruptions in the broadcasting. We've not had that before, but uh, we're going to check in to see if there was anything that uh, was from our end of the broadcast. I hope not. Um, you know, this has been terrific. Uh, the fact that you, uh, our history major uh, really make, gives you a perspective about what's going on in our country. And we very much appreciate your perspective that you shared with us today. And we look forward to uh, having Rick Callender and maybe uh, Reverend Moore give you, a, give you a call and say, hey, man, uh, you want to come over and be part of our, of our Rotary Club in San Jose? We're the oldest one around here, uh, except for San Francisco, of course. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that will do it for us. We let the staff go back, and uh, um, that'll terminate our broadcast for today. Thank See you, you next welcome. Wednesday. Oh, what do you got? Just you got something? Thank, just wanted to say thank you. Oh well, yeah, that goes without saying. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. All right, Thanks. it's a pleasure. Thanks, and Paul. Thanks, Paul. Arthur. <laughs> Tell Arthur I'm looking forward to joining through him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think you have 150 sponsors. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Thanks. Take care. All right. Take Bye. care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.